take time uh, to share our appreciation for the men and women of the Little Rock Police Department who are waking up each and every day to protect and serve the state's capital city. Uh, they are to be commended. Uh, we're grateful for them. Uh, and they continue to lead and serve and protect well uh, with a close to 80% capture rate. And so when we talk about uh, this public health emergency, I also want to take time to recognize that we have before us today our city's police chief, Keith Humphrey. We also have the director of Office of Neighborhood Safety and Mr. Michael Sanders, uh, who reports to uh, Ms. Dana Doucette, who is the leader of the community programs, uh, who plays a vital role uh, in what we'll be discussing today. And so as we uh, really go into the uh, nuts and bolts about um, the even additional work that we're doing to ensure uh, that we have an even safer city, uh, we'll talk through uh, additional measures that have been taken, the reason why, uh, as we continue to move forward. Uh, but what I do want to talk about uh, is understanding um, being a son of Little Rock and really knowing uh, our city's history, uh, and particularly as it relates to crime. Having been a son of Little Rock and growing up, uh, oftentimes uh, many people are saying that we're getting close to uh, the Mangan and Little Rock days. As someone who was a child uh, during the Bangin and Little Rock days, someone who has many family members and friends who were greatly impacted uh, by that term, that time, I can tell you, uh, we are nowhere close to it uh, whatsoever. Uh, but we also understand, uh, me personally, as someone who has many family members and friends that were impacted during that time of gang activity, um, I'm not a unique person, uh, I'm not special. I was a blessing away from being dead and in jail, uh, like many other people, but for um, a praying mother, a praying family, but for education and sports and arts and wraparound services, I stand before you here today. And in understanding uh, the criminal background here in our city and understanding how we're nowhere close to where we were uh, in the game banking in, in Little Rock days, we do understand we have seen an uptick in violent crime. Uh, we understand uh, that residents are concerned. And I want you to also know uh, that your mayor is just as concerned and that this is a top priority of not only the men and women of the Little Rock Police Department, it's a top priority of our administration. And growing up here and understanding crime has ebbed and flowed uh, here in this city. Uh, what will generally happen is we'll see an uptick uh, in crime uh, and then it's stepped out for a short period of time then uh, we'll experience a lull in crime. Then they'll come back and they'll see uh, additional uptick. We're in that uptick period. And guess what? It is not acceptable at any point in time to see an uptick uh, in violent crime. It's not acceptable at any point in time to see not only violent crime, uh, but just traditional crime in general. Uh, so whether it is a smash and grab, whether it's a homicide, none of it is acceptable uh, for this administration, none of it is acceptable for the residents uh, of the city of Little Rock, uh, and we understand and want to ensure that you know uh, that this administration, that your state's capital city, understands how important it is to get a hold of this violent crime uptick, which we are doing quite well with the men and women of Little Rock Police Department, but understand it has to be more than law enforcement. As I shared earlier, uh, the men and women of Little Rock Police Department has a close to 80% capture rate. And what that means is, is when you commit crime in Little Rock, we will catch you. Uh, what that means is that not only will we catch you, we'll prosecute you to the fullest extent of our ability as we work with our local, state, and federal prosecutors. We are already and have been working with the members of the federal resource team, whether it's the ATF, whether it's DEA, FBI. And if many will recall, back in the summer of 2021, we announced Operation Ceasefire. And Operation Ceasefire got close to 100 of our most violent criminals off of the streets here in the city of Little Rock. But we also have to understand, too, that much of this crime is not always the residents of Little Rock. There are outside entities that are coming to our city uh, from other cities that we have been working to address with our other federal partners from that particular standpoint. And so when we move from that standpoint that it has to be more than just our law enforcement officers, it has to be a holistic approach. It has to be focusing on community violence intervention. It has to focus on prevention and intervention treatment because we understand that we have to focus on both the short-term 
as well as the long term to truly address systemic root causes. We have to invest in the people of Little Rock. We most importantly have to invest in the youth and the young adults. When we see the 64 homicides that were experienced in 2021, your mayor gets a phone call each time there's a homicide. And a piece of me diminishes each time. Because we're praying with the mother, we're praying with the father, we're praying with the grandmother and aunt and uncle, and they're tired of it. And quite frankly, I get tired of making the phone calls too, but we want to make sure that we're always there for the residents. And so we're figuring out ways to reduce the number of phone calls we have to make to a mother, a father, a sister, and a brother. We were just at a prayer vigil, and as I shared at that prayer vigil, uh, faith without works is dead, and we have more work to do. We're going to keep praying, but we got to keep focusing on proactive policing, but also prevention, intervention, and treatment work. And the reason why is because we want to ensure that we save a generation of young people. Again, 64 homicides, and the majority of those homicides were between the ages of 11 to 24 in 2021. Same thing in 2020 when we had 55 homicides between the ages of 11 and 24. That tells us that we have to get it right when it comes to prevention, intervention, and treatment and addressing root causes. That was the reason. That was the reason why for the public health emergency. We understood that we had a violent weekend, that late January weekend. Something that we don't normally see. We've already shared that we've been working with our federal partners, we've been taking violent criminals off, but we also understand that we have a root cause issue in our city. And that's the reason why we went forward with the public health emergency as we move forward. What I now want to take this time is not only focus on the public health emergency. Uh, we've been doing a number of different things as it relates to our juveniles, understanding that we will be addressing uh, juvenile load loitering within businesses because what we're seeing is an uptick of juveniles out at different businesses and what happens is they're gathered there and then once they leave there something may happen on social media and then the next resort is to picking up an AK-15. Literally. We have teenagers who have access to AK-15, teenagers who don't understand conflict resolution, teenagers who have fallen to uh, a lack of resources, whether it's education or wraparound resources, and we have to address those root causes to prevent that teenager from accessing an AK-15. I want that to sit with you for a minute. We have teenagers who have access to military weapons, Teenagers who are not adults, teenagers who do not see past the age of 25 because for whatever reason they've lost hope. And it's our duty to ensure that we provide hope to the hopeless. And that's the reason why in the coming days we'll be announcing a hope advisory council to continue to help move forward as it relates to what we're doing with prevention, intervention, treatment, to help continue to move forward with proactive policing, but also what we're doing to address systemic and root causes. That'll be led uh, by this administration, by the individuals who are here with us today and the countless people who are working to get this issue under control. But not just for the short term, but for the long term. Again, we're focused on how do we save a generation by investing in ourselves, by focusing on the root causes of these issues. Last night, in addition, uh, I want to take time to share appreciation to the men and women of the Little Rock City Board of Directors, who not only uh, agreed to acknowledge this as a public health emergency, uh, to allow us to expedite processes as it relates to procurement efforts to ensure that we get more federal and local resources on the streets to ensure that we are focused on community violence interventionists, focusing on street interventionists, focusing on more social workers to address issues that our law enforcement officers should not be asked to do. And so last night, after a close to a five-hour long city board of director meeting, which we want to commend the men and women of the Little Rock City Board because it's just that serious to each of us of how we have to get this violent crime, but focusing on systemic and root causes, where we have already allocated close to $2 million to address these issues. And last night, we were able to approve close to 11 organizations. I want to take time to acknowledge these organizations that will be helping us to address systemic and root causes.
That's Arkansas Community Dispute Resolution Centers, Incorporated, Unity Martial Arts, the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, Brandon House Cultural Arts, Restore Hope, Boys and Girls Club of Central Arkansas, Our House, Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Arkansas, Songbird Multimedia, Lessons Learned, and a day labor program provided by Fab 44. These efforts are in addition to proactive policing, in addition to targeted patrols, in addition to increased presence, in addition to our streets crime unit that has been working to help cut our violent crime in half in 2021. These are things that have been going on, but we understood that we have to do more than just law enforcement. It is a both and approach, proactive policing and prevention. And so what we want to do is utilize the American Rescue Plan Act dollars of close to $2 million to ensure that we get these dollars on the street. And we're excited about these 11 organizations. And of these 11 organizations, close to five or six are new organizations that are new to the city of Little Rock procurement process. What that means is there's a new set of eyes, a new set of ideas on how we are addressing youth and young adult violence. Because I can tell you today, having grown up during the game bang in the Little Rock days, our youth are totally different than in the 90s. Social, we have youth right now that are being paid to do certain things on social media to get a thousand or two thousand dollars that we know has a direct effect on a potential homicide a week later. That is what we're dealing with. It's a new phenomenon. And so when you're dealing with a new phenomenon, you cannot utilize old approaches. And that's the reason why we're taking on new approaches, new ideas, new opportunities, new organizations to ensure that we are helping the men and women of the Little Rock Police Department. Because I can tell you right now, they're doing their job. We had the highest full-time complement of officers today than we did in 2016. And to, at the end of 2021, we had 594 officers authorized. At the end of 2021, of those authorized officers, because we understand that authorized officers means our officers that are patrolling the streets as well as our leadership and management team. And we've increased close to 62% since 2016. We do not have as much vacancies as we had in 2017 during the Power Ultra Lounge. Today we have somewhere close to about 64 officers that are vacant, five officers, five are sergeants, somewhere around one is an assistant chief, so somewhere around 70 vacancies. But when you think about that 70, again, 64 of the 70 are patrol officers. Understanding attrition each year, we have 40 to 50 officers that are going to retire, just a matter of fact. I'm happy to report that we are continuously always focused on recruitment. I want to give a shout out to Major Tyrell, who's been doing a yeoman's job in doing that. We just uh, recruited close to 20, somewhere around between 16 to 20 officers uh, that are just starting right now. So that number now transitions somewhere from 64 to 44. And so we are nowhere close to where it was in 2017 when we had close to 100 vacancies. So again, we had the highest complement of officers today than we did in 2016. And they're doing their job. We're grateful for the street crime unit. We're grateful for Operation Ceasefire. But we also understand it's a both and approach. Proactive policing, predictive policing, targeted patrols, increased presence, directed patrols, but also prevention, intervention, treatment programs where we're investing in our people, that we're helping our young adults. That's why I'm excited that we'll be having our summer youth program. Because we also understand we got to give something for our youth to do. They need to have a job. We need to keep them busy. They need to be in our community programs. They need to be in our community centers. They need to focus on our midnight basketball. They need to focus on these 11 programs that we'll be focusing on. But also, they need a job. The best way to address crime is jobs and education. When you see a safe neighborhood, you see a neighborhood full of jobs. When you see a safe neighborhood, you see a neighborhood full of access to capital. When you see a safe neighborhood, you see a neighborhood who understands financial literacy. And so again, when you see a safe neighborhood, you see proactive policing. It's a both and approach. And that's what we've decided to do, is address crime, proactive policing, targeted patrols, increased presence, but also to invest in our youth and our young adults. I want to take this time now uh, to allow Chief Keith Humphrey to get in more details as well uh, in regards to public safety. I also want to take time to recognize Chief Buley and Haskins who do a phenomenal job. Chief Buley leads, he's, he's over here to the right, leads our investigative unit who helps with that capture rate along with the 
uh, operations and patrol side with Chief Haskins, and they've both been doing a phenomenal job and have many great years of service, and we want to say, share our appreciation to the two of you and your leadership. Chief Humphrey. Thank you, Mayor. I, I uh, echo those sentiments about the women and men of our department and uh, the leadership of Chief Haskins and Chief Buley. I just want to um, remind you all, each time we talk, we talk about the hard work that our women and our men are doing each and every day. Uh, I think that sometimes we allow the numbers to uh, overshadow the hard work and the commitment from these officers and the arrests and things that we're making. But I just want to put, want to put a few things in perspective really quick. Uh, the city is 123 square miles. 123 square miles, and we have some, some visual aids here. 123 square miles. Population as of last census count is 203,000 citizens. And when you when you hear about violent crime, there's a there's a perception that this is the city is being taken over with violent crime. The maps that you'll see here, we call these our, our hotspot maps. And if you look at these maps, the darker, the denser the colors, this is the areas that we've identified as our hotspots, the areas that we believe, that we know, are causing uh, where we're seeing our violent crimes. So if you look, once you look at the map, you see that these are not occurring throughout the city. We wanted to make that very clear. So I, I would ask you to, to look at those and see that there's pockets, small pockets throughout the city where these violent crimes are occurring. There's also small pockets in some of these same areas where we're noticing our loitering issues. And we know that when we have people hanging out, uh, we're not talking about people that are hanging out for a reason, but people who are just hanging out, there is a possibility and sometimes a probability that that could turn into a, a, into a crime, up to a violent crime. And so we also have the map showing the density of the locations where our violent, where our loitering is, is, hap is happening. So I just want to, you know, I want to share with you all how a, a, a day in the, in the life of the, of the Little Rock Police Department and how we determine how do we deploy uh, short term, long term, what's helping, what's not helping, what other resources we may need. Uh, and that includes community partners. Uh, that includes our uh, federal partners. That includes uh, various departments within the city, various departments within the county, various departments within the state. So one of the things that we're focused on is pre precision policing. And you might ask what that is. Well, that is when police and community members are laser focused on problems. They're working together to address problems. <clears throat> We've said this forever. We cannot, we cannot do this alone as a police department. The thing that, that's really unique is I want to thank the mayor and the board of directors by realizing that this is a public health issue and the resources that are needed are additional to law enforcement. <clears throat> and so when we talk about conflict resolution and jobs and we talk about uh, wraparound programs and things like that, we the other day met with a community member and we were talking about our summer youth program and Within a matter of 30 minutes, this gentleman had gone to Central High and had identified 30 to 40 kids uh, that have already applied for the summer youth program that we believe those are 30 to 40 kids that have hope now. Hope in getting those job skills that will help them uh, reduce the chance or minimize the chances of being a statistic. But you'll hear us talk about DDACs, data-driven approaches to crime and traffic safety. You hear us talk about our record management system, our, our computer-aided dispatch system. You hear us talk about crime analysis. This is how we focus the, the information that you see on these maps. This is where we get that information from. Data-driven approaches. We're very technologically sound and data-driven police department. That's how you determine where the resources are. We realize that crime, different crimes are happening in different parts of the city. No one crime is happening in one part of the city. It's various, and various reasons cause this. Um, what you're seeing now is a 180-day um, window. So we looked at, we're looking at 180 days of these maps uh, when it comes to the violent crime and the loitering issues. Uh, various things contribute to various crimes. I'll say that again, various things contribute to various crimes. There's no one ingredient to a crime, various things. 
whether that's socioeconomic, whether that's educate, lack of education, so conflict resolution, uh, lack of job training, all those things could contribute, not just one thing contributes. And the, and the majority of our violent crimes, and I'll say this again, the majority of our violent crimes that we've seen this year are homicides have been known acquaintances. We continue to see that and it goes back to a lack of conflict resolution. So what we're seeing internally and also externally, we see more uh, collaboration in our efforts with our, our state, local, federal partners. Uh, we have officers assigned to task forces. What we're seeing, we're seeing more officers at the, based on the leadership of Chief Haskins and Chief Bewley and our majors. The, the discussions are being had in briefings before the officers go on the streets. They're happening in all briefings. They're happening between command staff, sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes four or five times a week, uh, sometimes multiple times during an hour. We're talking about, okay, what we're doing, what can we have, what are the trends. We um, Supervisors are expecting more from their officers. I'm expecting more. The citizens are expecting more from me. I'm expecting more from our officers. Supervisors are expecting more from their staff, and we're getting that. We're getting those results. Results. Since um, October the 21st, uh, you all know we introduced our online reporting system, and to date, that has netted 1,400 reports. 1,400 reports have been taken on our online reporting system, which uh, which allows 1,100 hours. Of, of staffing hours that was shifted toward other activities, mainly patrol. Uh, our commanders have been more flexible in utilizing overtime and other resources to address these pockets that we're talking about. Uh, they've been empowered to do that, and they're doing a really good job of doing that. Um, we've talked about our mutual aid uh, components. Uh, we could not do this if it was not for mutual aid efforts in our, in our partners in state, federal, county uh, agencies. I just want to kind of talk about some things really quick um, that we have, that we've done. We talk about mutual aid and, and the hard work that our street crimes unit, our intel units, our property crime detectives, everybody. It's an all-inclusive. Uh, our statistics, our DDACs, and, and, and our co uh, collaboration with our community partners uh, have led to three major details in our city. Uh, one was Spanish John's apartment, one was Oxford Arms apartment, and one has been Community Market. Uh, with the help of our community and our intel, and we have been able to address those issues. Um, we hope that these are long-term solutions, but we're continually monitoring those. Uh, we had calls from uh, neighbors the other day to talk about the community market, which is right now is, is, is closed based on some serious uh, violations. And so that is a partnership between the community, that's a partnership, and that's hard work of our officers, our city attorney's office, our fire department, our code enforcement office. We all been working together on these areas, these three areas was a, collab a, co a collaboration of all of those entities working together. Let me talk a little bit about our task force. You hear me mention WAVE. Uh, WAVE is the acronym for Working Against Violent Entities. And that, uh, those uh, teams consist of our police department, our special, in, uh, in special investigations division, our task force officers. You all hear us talk about GitRock. Our task force officers, they're assigned to federal uh, partnerships. Uh, <clears throat> we also hit the areas of John Barrow, uh, Midtown, downtown, and South, uh, South, South, uh, South Division. And one of our wave details that happened back on the 20th of January netted three firearms, thir over $13,000 in cash, uh, approximately a quarter of an ounce of cocaine, two pounds of high-grade marijuana, approximately one fluid ounce of PCP, six grams of suspected fentanyl, 20 dosage units of prescriptive, prescription medications, and 12 prepackaged TCH pens. The, these are the things that, that, that these men and women are doing on a daily basis. The, 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 the initiatives that they're taking, the intel, getting the information, taking that information and making these type of arrests. This is just one. We've got another one, WAVE uh, initiative, that we'll be talking about at a later date. And the mayor talked about ceasefire, same thing. 
continue efforts that a lot of times our community doesn't know about, but it's, it's, up to, it's up to us to provide that information to assure that we are working extremely hard. To date, we've taken 80 guns, firearms off the street, 80 firearms, we're nearly 60 arrests related to those firearms, so it's illegal guns, and, and individuals have been in possession of those illegal guns. Um, of, the 20, of the 2022, year 2022, our 10 homicides, we've made arrests of 60% of those homicides, and we're continuing to address those and continuing to gather information from the community uh, regarding uh, uh, the, the whereabouts of these individuals or any information they may have related to these tragedies. Also, I want to kind of touch on just uh, about our community efforts. We have participated and we have a lot of community programs planned for the upcoming month. Uh, last week, uh, we had a uh, partnership with a gospel choir out of Pine Bluff at Centennial Park. You all know the history of Centennial Park, but there was a video shoot there, amazing video shoot. We had almost over a hundred, we had over a hundred attendees about 60 of those attendees was members of our OK program, young men from our OK program, young ladies from our GEMS program. Uh, they also participated in that. And it was basically to show a community effort, to show that we can all come together. And I really like the fact that these were our youth. Our youth were involved, and people are going to be able to see a positive side of our youth and not necessarily what we're saying here about the uh, respective ages of these individuals that are committing some of our violent crimes. We cannot put these good kids in that same category. But at the same time, we can't give up on our youth. Uh, this week, we have a courageous conversations with the police. Um, we are going to, uh, staff and I, are going to sit down and listen to the concerns of our citizens. Uh, sometimes we just need to listen uh, and, and hear what they say. Uh, instead of always trying to say what we're doing, let's listen to what they might be able, they will be able to provide us some things that might assist us in our efforts. Uh, pastries with a cop. We're going to sit down and have conversations. You've heard of coffee with a cop. We're putting a different spin on it. Uh, pastries with a cop. So that's upcoming. Uh, youth cleanup with the police is upcoming uh, event. Our Explorer program, which is an amazing program that we believe will help us in our recruiting efforts. It's up and running. Uh, we have several young men and women that are participating in that program. We're excited about that. Our cadet program is continually growing. Uh, the cadet program is, is responsible for what we've seen in our telephone reporting unit to take those reports. And those individuals go on to become police officers, go to, to police academy. Class 100 has started, our centennial class. Uh, for the first time in the history of this organization, we've had we have more females in, in a police academy class than we've ever had in the history. So we're looking at well over 51% of our this academy class as female. That's because of the efforts of our female supervisors, Chief Haskins, Sergeant Dewana Phillips, and others uh, took it upon themselves to do a historical photo shot in front of Central High School showing the, the, the women of this police department and the, and the dynamic impact that they make to the department and to this community. And also we're hiring for class 101. Uh, that class will hire and uh, start in August. Uh, you all know $10,000 signing bonus uh, is, is being offered. And also another program that we're doing is Operation Watchful Eye. Operation Watchful Eye. And we're identifying kids through social media, those individuals that may not have an understanding of what's happening when they pose with weapons or when they pose with money or they make they say certain things. So these are things that we're doing. Also, there's been a recent announcement of two part-time social workers that will be working with the police department. As you all know, we have a full-time social worker. That program is, is, is uh, paying dividends. We believe now with the uh, addition of two part-time supervisors, and I'm sorry, uh, part-time social workers, which we would not be able to do it if it was not for the $1.5 million crime reduction funds uh, that have been set aside by the Board of Directors. And also, current, we hope in the next week or so we'll be able to identify, uh, to um, not identify, but to be able to post two openings, part-time openings for community youth violent crime prevention advocates who will work closely with our school resource officers, our gyms program, and also our um, OK program. So I just wanted to tell you, we got a lot of things going on toward 
uh, the reduction of violent crime, both reactively and proactively. Um, and I want you all to remember that term I use, pre precision policing. It's a collaboration, focused collaboration between police and the community. And that is what it's going to take in order for us to continue to, to, to have these, see these numbers of violent crime redu uh, reduce. Thank you. Before I give some final comments and then we'll take questions again, uh, this is an effort that we committed uh, that we'll be giving weekly briefings to make sure the public is aware because uh, many times the public may not be aware of everything that's going on around them as we're working to protect and serve each resident here in the city of Little Rock. Uh, before I give some final comments uh, and then go to questions we have today, uh, Mr. Michael Sanders, who's director at the Office of Neighborhood Safety, he's just going to give a brief overview um, of the work that's been done to get us to this point as it relates to the 11 organizations that will be accessing the close to $2 million of the American Rescue Plan Act dollars to focus on how we, in addition to focus on proactive policing, that we're focused on prevention, intervention, and treatment uh, programs uh, to address the systemic and the root causes. Again, this will align uh, in the coming days when we announce our HOPE Advisory Council, uh, which stands for Holistic uh, Outreach Prevention in Each Neighborhood. Holistic outreach prevention and in each neighborhood. Um, Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mayor. Um, first, I'd like to thank the board for approving uh, the new funding uh, programs on last night uh, and then acknowledge our director, Dana DeSette, for weathering the storm. Uh, excellent job uh, uh, in presenting those programs. Uh, like the mayor said, we um, approached a different uh, paradigm in the way that we um, provided funding uh, to some agencies. We saw the need to strategically and target, uh, uh, strategically target some funding um, categories. And so in that, we had a bid that went out uh, for agencies to submit proposals on how they can curtail the violence. And so in that, uh, I believe we, re we received uh, approximately 20 plus applications. Uh, and of that, uh, about 10 of those applications were awarded. Uh, the process um, happens uh, on the bid, it goes open, uh, vendors um, submit applications, and then we have a five person panel to review those applications and score them. Uh, with the threshold being a 60% moves you to the next stage. And then uh, in this instance, we took uh, the top two uh, programs who scored the highest uh, in each category. Those categories being conflict resolution and anger management, hospital-based intervention, life skills and workforce readiness, mental health and wellness, prevention of criminal activity through violence intervention. Uh, what this does is, uh, the city, uh, the Department of Community Programs, Office of Neighborhood, Neighborhood Safety, we have a number of touch points where we come in contact with individuals and residents who need services. Uh, they're in need of resources. And so uh, with that, uh, as you can imagine, we see a lot of individuals in need of services. And so this creates opportunities for us to now refer those individuals to the needed services. Uh, oftentimes we come in contact with them, uh, we get them ready, all dressed up with no place to go. And so this gives us an opportunity to have some experts in the field uh, and to uh, collaborate with businesses who are already uh, doing the work and now we can actually refer those individuals to those much needed services. Now also we realize that there are agencies who did not make the, the, the grade or, or, or score high enough and so we see this as an opportunity now to reach out to those agencies and provide them with some technical assistance. Uh, we're planning um, a, a, uh, a, a workshop, so to speak. Uh, we don't know exactly the date right now, but it's going to be early March. Uh, and so we're looking to invite individuals who, uh, who may have an idea, who may have a nonprofit, or who may be in the beginning stages and have an expertise but trying to help them kind of uh, mold that programming and then teach them the process of how to do business with the city, how to apply for funding, how to register as a vendor, 
uh, and then even how to apply for a 501c3 status, that nonprofit status, so that they can uh, begin doing the much needed work and, and be, begin kind of um, codifying their efforts and, and, and uh, kind of putting it into a, a, a fashion to make them uh, um, able to uh, win an award or, or get a contract with the city. Uh, and then we're also with these new programs uh, coming out, uh, we're looking to, to do a, a resource uh, event. Um, and so inviting individuals to come and have booths so that we can present all of these resources that the city and the community have to the public so that they can come learn a little bit more about our resources uh, and then better uh, kind of be able to uh, access those resources. Uh, so if, if you're an agency and you're looking to participate in one of our workshops, uh, you can email program referral at littlerock.gov. That's program referral, one word, at littlerock.gov. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Sanders. Uh, as we come to uh, a close of the commentary and then go straight to questions, uh, I do want to share just a few different things as we uh, talk about uh, what we're dubbing as Operation Hope, holistic outreach, uh, prevention in each neighborhood. Uh, and the reason why we say each neighborhood, as we shared earlier today and we saw this heat map of where uh, the pockets of crime are located, uh, as a resident of one of the areas where we see uh, the pockets of crime, that's some uh, area where I was born, raised, and I still reside in, I can tell you uh, that our street crimes unit, um, since uh, the very beginning when we op announced Operation Ceasefire and our Community Violence Reduction Plan in 2021, uh, we've definitely seen an increased present, uh, presence in the most uh, crime-hidden areas uh, within the city, and that's where your mayor lives, uh, literally. Uh, and so uh, we say that from a standpoint to understand is that we are uh, focused on proactive policing. Uh, we are focused on predictive policing as well, but it's going to take the entire community. It's an all-hands-on-deck approach. And so it's not an either or, it's a both and. And the both and includes this holistic approach, this holistic uh, outreach as it relates to prevention in each neighborhood. Because what we're seeing is that we have lost some of our youth and young adults uh, who haven't seen a life past 25. And that's the reason why we're focused on these approaches. I also want to take this time uh, is to share what we've been doing uh, to ensure that the men and women police department understand how much we appreciate them. Uh, for the first time in five years, they received a 2% raise. They have not received a raise uh, since 2017. I was proud to provide that within our 2021 budget. They've now received that 2% raise, something they haven't re received. And according to what's going to probably be happening within the state legislature, we're working as well to get uh, figure out other ways to increase uh, resources for, from that standpoint. Secondly, also, uh, as we talk through that, is what we've been able to do with the $10,000 sign-on bonus where we increased it from $5,000 to $10,000. That's been very helpful in our recruitment efforts, and that's the reason why we are continuing to ensure uh, that we have uh, an optimal level of a police source, which I shared earlier, uh, that we have the highest level today than we had in 2016. Uh, so with that being stated, I, think, I want to thank Chief Humphrey as well as Mr. Sanders, who are here with us today, as well as Assistant Chief Haskins and Bewley, who are here to the side, available for particular questions uh, from the podium as, as it relates to their respective areas. But again, as it relates to the federal resources and local resources, it doesn't happen without a team. Uh, we thank the members of the city board, but also want to take time to acknowledge uh, our procurement team, uh, led by Vitesh Patel and Ms. Tony, as well as Amanda Jones within our grants department, of course, community programs, which we've already discussed. Uh, that's how we've been able to roll out this close to $2 million in American Rescue Plan Act dollars, as well as an additional million dollars that we received at the end of December from the U.S. Department of Justice. So I just want to make sure we share the appreciation to our team uh, in those particular efforts, as well as Mr. Jim Brooks, who does a lot of our crime analyst data. We'll now open the floor for any questions. Well, I'll give you a great example, um, and Mr. Sanders can give some uh, additional details if he would like, but a great example is FAB 44, uh, uh, where it's, uh, many people are familiar with the Bridge to Work program, uh, where we are uh, working with our brothers and sisters who are experiencing homelessness to help uh, as it relates to 
uh, picking up uh, trash areas as well as with litter. Uh, that's a day labor program. We understand that many uh, individuals in our city, uh, due to a number of different circumstances, uh, even while we already do ban the box, it's just really hard uh, for an individual uh, to, that's re-entering into society to uh, get a job with a living wage. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we understand is we have to keep our youth and our young adults busy. Again, 11 to 24, 11 to 24. So our youth and our young adults, uh, we want to make sure that they're staying busy, want to make sure they're staying productive. Uh, and this is a way that they can stay productive by providing uh, an opportunity where FAB4 is the overall organization uh, that will be hiring uh, these individuals that are having a hard time finding a job. Uh, and helps them the opportunity to also one day become entrepreneurs. Uh, because it's sometimes hard to get uh, a nine to five with certain, uh, certain individuals have a certain particular record and want to still have a living wage. And so we want to thank FAB 44. So that's a great example from a day laborer standpoint. Also, we think through uh, the works of uh, United Martial Arts. You know, some people will say it was, it's, it's Taekwondo, things like nature. But if you grew up in Little Rock, uh, there were many, uh, many of our youth who understand and remember uh, American Taekwondo on, on the Southwest Little Rock on baseline, how many kids were saved by being engaged in that particular sports and that discipline. And so we would, again, want to keep our kids active, engaged, and quite frankly, kind of tired so they're not getting into any mischief as well. And so when we talk through these organizations, we have to be new, innovative, and figuring out how do we get our children our young adults off the streets of crime. And so and we do that by focusing on these new organizations, these new ideas from that particular standpoint. So those are two examples, whether it's FAB 44, whether it's United Mar Martial Arts, as well as the uh, Restore Hope. Uh, and if you haven't got a chance to understand what Restore Hope is, it truly focuses on the whole family and how uh, crime and re-entering society impacts the whole family, not only from a mental health and a social uh, work standpoint, but also ensuring that we are creating um, adding more uh, individuals to the job workforce, but not only adding them to the job workforce at a living wage, but ensure that they are able to create a sustainable family. And so those are the type of organizations that we're investing in. Again, this is for a long-term approach. We're gonna address, again, when you commit crime, our officers will catch you. We're gonna, we've already been increasing uh, targeted uh, presence in, in most crime-ridden areas of our city. We already are working with our federal resources. Again, we're talking about how do we save a generation of people, our people. Next question. You mentioned a long-term approach with the focus on the next generation. What's the time frame then for these concrete changes? I think any time that you save a child or a young, youth or young adult, that's a positive change. Um, and so uh, I'm not at liberty to say that you know we're going to have a solution that we're going to change a generation in a year. Uh, but what you're hearing from your mayor is that we're committed, uh, that it's, it's past time. I said, again, I've grown up in this city. I've seen crime up. I've seen crime go down. I've seen increased target patrols, and we'll address it from the short term. We experience the lull. Something else happens. It goes back up. We know there are other forces, whether it be outside individuals that are coming to our city. We're addressing that as well. That's why we're addressing with the ATF, the FBI, the DEA, our U.S. Marshals, and our U.S. Attorney. We're addressing the short term. And that's the reason why we're taking the guns off our street. But again, the gun is just a tool. The gun is just a tool. We have to address our people to ensure that we are focused on prevention, intervention, and treatment that will address the systemic and the root causes. Uh, I have not uh, at liberty to discuss that uh, ongoing process. What about the internal investigation within the Little Rock Police Chief Enforcement? Do your team have concluded, or what goals are involved in that? We're not at liberty because it's an ongoing process. Not at liberty to, to share. Sure, the question was for the audience uh, or those watching online, who has direct oversight? Ultimately, the buck stops uh, with your mayor, number one. Uh, however, uh, we, we have a leadership chain. Uh, clearly, this, the, these dollars don't happen without the members uh, of the City of Little Rock Board of Directors as well. There are many different oversights, and so we want to acknowledge that as it relates to the day-to-day. -day, the day-to-day -day, uh, is led by the direction of Ms. Dana Doucette. Uh, Mr. Sanders reports directly to Ms. Dana Doucette. He is 
focused on that day to day. We also have, uh, so I would say it's both city leadership as well as community leadership. And so from the community leadership standpoint, that's the reason why we have a uh, city's youth and fa uh, children, youth and families commission uh, that will be uh, monitoring uh, the progress as well as uh, within community programs. And again, our city's attorney's office, because these individuals, these organizations are tied to contracts and that they do not fulfill uh, their responsibility within the contract, we can cease those contracts. There's always a, a, something we're always looking at. We're always looking at uh, ways to, to be more efficient. You know, we uh, expect our staffing study to be uh, coming out here pretty soon, and that's going to be able to tell us uh, some, some things on what we can civilianize, what we, uh, where we need more bodies, uh, and what I mean that more staffing. So I think that's going to help us too. But we're always looking at ways to be more proficient and efficient in, in how we do our job. Next question. Assistant Chief Wayne Bewley, who's over our invested division about the head of the Baker. The only thing that I can say is, is that our investigative unit has um, put a lot of work and effort in that investigation, as you would expect. Uh, we've been in continuous uh, communications uh, with, with those that were involved, and the investigation is still very much active and ongoing. And, and that's about the best that I can tell you at this point. One last question. Seeing none, thank you so much. We do appreciate you. We'll be back before you uh, next week.